I'm Vinny Politan. Great to have you with us tonight here on Closing Arguments. We're getting ready for the next live trial here on Court TV. We're going to talk about it now. Um, for those of you who don't know, before I joined Court TV the first time around, I was working down in Central Florida, Central Florida News 13, all local all the time. Um, beautiful area in the country. And there was a town there called Winter Park, which was like, that's where you wanted to live, right? You're in Central Florida in the Orlando area. You know, that is like the town to live in, folks, with money, um, beautiful um, lakes. It was just a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful town. Anyhow, the next live trial, Court TV, Winter Park, Florida, is where either a murder or maybe self-defense or maybe a heart attack, something took place. We know that Michael Redlick ended up dying there, and now his wife has been charged with his murder, Julie Janae. Has more for us tonight. I believe my husband is deceased. I, I just, he's stiff and he's, I didn't know that he might have a heart attack. Michael Redlick, an executive for the University of Central Florida Sports Business Department and a former NBA executive for the Memphis Grizzlies, was found dead in his Winter Park home. Okay, did you just find him? No, actually, it happened last night. Redlick's wife, Danielle, called police to report his death, but not until 11 hours after he was fatally wounded after an argument. She initially claimed that her husband had a heart attack and then changed her story when questioned by a 911 operator. He was not okay last night. We had we had altercation and he stabbed himself and I ran into the bathroom and then when I came out, I tried to help him. When officers arrived on the scene, they found a disheveled Danielle Redlick outside her home. Police photos show Redlick with wounds to her wrist and blood on her neck and feet. She was taken to an Orlando area hospital. Inside the home, police discovered evidence of what appeared to be a violent crime, including a pile of bloody towels, bloody footprints, and a five-gallon bucket filled with pink water. Police suggested it looked as if someone had been cleaning up. A serrated knife was found on the floor near the entry of the kitchen and two additional knives in the sink, all of them with traces of blood on them. Investigators interviewed Danielle Redlick at the hospital. She told them the fight between her and her husband started over a text from another man the night before a stabbing. Thursday, um... My husband was very belligerent and distraught. He found out, um, he found a text from another man to me and we had had some issues in the last year. He basically cheated on me and it was a big, long, drawn out thing and we finally came around to living together again and possibly trying to work it through, but I think that really wasn't happening. It According to the police report, the couple had a complicated relationship. Redlick, 20 years older than Danielle, was first married to her mother. And after she died from cancer, Redlick began dating and eventually married his stepdaughter. But their 17-year relationship, according to investigators, was rocky, marred by alleged infidelity and arguments over dating apps. A family friend said that Michael Redlick even joked about the potential for violence. How are things at home or how is your wife? And he would say, as long as I can lock the knives up, I'm okay. The couple's two children, 11 and 15 years old, were not at home at the time of the alleged stabbing. Police say they told investigators that it was their mother who was volatile and argumentative. One of those fights in a separate incident prompted a call to 911 by their father. Yes. There's a woman that's a danger to herself and to others right now. A gentleman that's a danger to all. I'm sorry. Pardon me? Pardon me? Will you stop? All right. I'll call, I will call you back. I will call you back in five minutes. Investigators say that Michael was stabbed multiple times in the torso and concluded those injuries could not have been self-inflicted. <laughs> Danielle Redlick was arrested and charged with her husband's murder and also with trying to conceal evidence. She has pleaded not guilty and maintains her innocence. If convicted, she faces up to life in prison. All right, there's a lot of parts of this story you, you could dive into. Um, 
first, the nature of the relationship, how they met, all of that. But first, let's bring in our think tank. Joining us tonight in Englewood Cliffs, New Jersey, criminal defense attorney, former prosecutor, Albert H. Wunsch III in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, family law attorney, Jennifer Brandt. And in Cabaretti in the Dominican Republic tonight, criminal defense attorney, Darnell Crossland, down in the DR. How about that? Okay. Um, let, let's begin here. Before we start discussing anything in this case, I want to go back and listen to the 911 call from Danielle Redlick. And, and let's listen closely to what she tells the operator. I believe my husband is deceased. I, I just, he's stiff and he's wounded. He might have had a heart attack. I don't know. Did you just find him? No, actually, what happened last night. He was not okay last night. We had we had altercation, and he stabbed himself, and I ran into the bathroom, and then when I came out, I was trying to help him, and I saw he was lying in blood. And then okay. I tried to help him, and I couldn't. Okay, this is an obvious problem. And Al, let's start. Which came first, the heart attack or the self-inflicted knife wounds? Well, I, I think I'd have a heart attack if someone was stabbing me. So that's probably what happened in this instance. So she may not be lying in that fact. There may have been a heart attack. And it would have been precipitated by the fact that she had a serrated knife and was stabbing me multiple times. So that's problem number one. Problem number two is Darnell's on the islands and I'm exceedingly jealous. <laughs> Problem number three is that I am also in the islands, but that's Manhattan, Staten, and Long. Okay, so that's what I wanna say on that. But let's go back to this situation. This story just stinks from the head down. There is nothing in this story. I don't understand how she didn't take that plea. I don't know how she is not like pleading to the manslaughter and just saying, thank you, Lord, that I got a manslaughter uh, case out of this because you've got all of the, I mean, 11 hours for 911, even, even if I couldn't remember the number for information, it wouldn't take me 11 hours to find out 911. But it took her 11 to do that. And then the fact that she did the cleanup and the fact that she's got these like weird wounds on herself that look probably self-inflicted to make it look like something happened to her. This is just a horrible case. And the fact that she's getting the public defender out of all this is even more bizarre to me. Because look at this home. It's an oh, Winter Park. It's beautiful. Home. Yeah, no, it's a it's a beautiful, beautiful neighborhood, uh, beautiful home. Jennifer Brandt, uh, you know, none of this makes sense. But now we, we, it's time for the trial. Everyone has a defense. They always do. The defense here, we believe, is going to be self defense. That's right. Absolutely. And, and how, how does that work? How do you go from heart attack to suicide to self defense and do it with a straight face? Well, I mean, she's going to claim that she was abused by him. He was he was unfaithful. He was a bad husband. He was abusive to her. It was self-defense. She had no other choice. She was shocked by what happened. That's what took her so long to call 911. I mean, OK, maybe it's not all plausible, but I think it's a defense. And I, I think that's what she's going to assert. I mean, that he's look at the, the what I can't get by in this case is the fact that he was her. She was his stepdaughter and then he married her. That's pretty bizarre in itself. So she's much younger and she can say, look, I, you know, he was controlling me. He was abusing me all throughout the marriage. I mean, there are a lot of things she can come up with and he's not there to uh, say that it's wrong. So I, I think she does have a defense and that's probably why she didn't take the plea. Yeah, I'm listening to those words, come up with. I always hear that <laughs> from, from the defense, Darnell. Why is that? They're going to come up with something. Why do you have to come up with something? Why, why, why can't we just tell the I truth? I mean the truth, Vinny. Why can't we just the tell the truth, I mean Darnell? The truth. Why, why does the defense always have to come up with something? It's because uh, they believe that the prosecution is right, and they believe that you're presumed guilty and you've got to prove yourself innocent, and that's really what our system of justice has come down to. That's why we have to come up with something. But the truth of the matter is, uh, in this particular case, I think Jennifer's right. We're heading towards an extreme emotional distress defense, and the whole setup uh, here, if, if this gentleman, um, that was his natural daughter, um, the jury will be looking at him as though he was the villain. Now, I think they're gonna be able to extrapolate that same feeling, even though it's his stepdaughter. 
he exercised all this control, all this power over her. And now um, there's probably going to be a history of mental control, physical control. And forget about the 911 calls. She probably was losing it. And I think that's why, to Al's point, she didn't take the manslaughter, because she's going to have her day in court and say, this was my father, and this was what I've been subjected to. So um, we don't have to come up with anything. We just have to present the case to the jury. And I think that she's going to have I like, a I like it better when you say that, because when you say, what are we going to come up with, uh, you know, <laughs> Al, I, and, and, and this issue is a real issue, I think, in the case, is the nature of the relationship, um, stepfather, but it seems that... You know, they had a real life together, two children that they raised. It wasn't like it was like a year and things went haywire. They were together for quite some time. They had a long relationship. So I've got to think that while it started a little different than most relationships, um, by the time you're, you're in the middle of the whole thing, you're raising a family, it might have some level of normalcy? Or am I completely off base here? Well, I mean, you know, it gives credence to the adage, uh, you know, all marriage is relative. But under the circumstances, this was a relationship that seemed to have been good. It didn't seem like it was something that was taking advantage of a stepdaughter position and things along those lines. She had kids with him. She had an age difference. She didn't seem to mind living in this million dollar house. She didn't seem to mind that, uh, you know, he was providing for her. I mean, there doesn't seem to be that this is the stepdaughter and, and you know, he's taking advantage of her and, and that this happened, like you said, just, you know, months after the, they buried the mom, all of a sudden, you know, he's running after her into the bedroom. So I don't think that's going to work to her advantage by any stretch of the imagination. I, and, you know, come up with, I, I, I agree with Darnell. I mean, that's not the, the phrase. You have to throw things out there that are plausible so that you can, you know, throw things out down. there. Now the defense <laughs> is just throwing things out. There. Come on, yeah, now. That's what this is. It's a Let's search for the it. truth and Let's we're just throwing it. things out there. Let's face it. Let's face it. This situation, it, you're not going to be able to get around an 11 hour gap. Okay, on a scenario with regards Unless you've to got a, a psychological expert to come in and explain what she's going through. That's the only way you know, I see it. I'm, ben, I'm not ben. selling it. I'm just throwing ben, ben. it out there, Al. I'm just throwing that, it out that's, there. That, that's now, like, you know, Al's like... Talking it, about, it, Al, Al's talking about uh, marriages. Wait, I'm sorry. So I can say, Al, wait, wait, Al, just, just stop it. Al's talking about marriages, and I can say as a divorce attorney, you know, you never know what's going on behind closed doors with people, and they may seem like they have a great relationship, and just because they have kids together doesn't mean that they have a great marriage. Let me tell you, there's plenty of people out there that have kids together that don't have great marriages, so I think there is trouble in this marriage. I think she's going to she's going to present the truth that there was a difficult relationship um, that he was controlling, she was emotionally abused, and that's her defense, that's her truth, um, because you don't like to say, come up with things. Um, and so I think- I'm not the one who says it, it's the defense play. attorneys who always say it. I don't say it, they're the ones. Darnell, does she have to testify in this case? Um, she doesn't have to, but in my experiences, um, and you know, again, winning several trials in a row as of late, um, I do believe that even though, um, <laughs> in the Caribbean, in the even Caribbean, though we, even though there. we say to the to the jury when we pick them, we say, um, you understand this individual has a right not to testify. Can you not hold that against them? Juries time and time again indicate that they want to hear the other person's side. So she doesn't have to, but I think this is such a human story that I think they'll benefit from having her testify. Yeah, I think I think she has to because she has to explain that that phone call to this jury. They have to understand why. Uh, and, and maybe a psychologist might do it uh, or someone else. But she has to explain because it doesn't make sense. I think Al is right on with that, that the 11 hours that you're waiting. And, and there's now, this is the third version of, of what happened because you listen to 911. It's a heart attack. Then it's suicide. Then we're at trial. And we've got a brand new story.